we are all good. Let's try that again. Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 151. My name is still Danny Beaumont, Principal Product Manager on Adobe Muse. In this session, we're going to focus on forms. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we're now using a different recording methodology, specifically because some folks wanted to watch the recordings on iPads, iPhones, God forbid, um, iOS devices. And Connect is pretty much flash-based, so with this new method, uh, you can watch it in that way. So if you go to Facebook or you go, in fact, I'll show you this. Let me go ahead and start recording my screen, and I'll show you around a little bit. As we progress, a uh, couple points you'll want to keep in mind. In the right-hand side here, there is a Resources tab. I've got a link. I've given you a tiny URL, so if you can't click the link, if you're watching the recording, you can type it in in your browser. This is kind of working notes that I use um, in order to prepare for the sessions. Wasn't a lot to call out in a Resources section, so you can just see the whole session notes that I'll go through today. All right, let me go ahead and share up my screen. And let's go ahead and start with a little bit of um, just basics around Muse, just real quick. So if you are somewhat new to Muse, there's terrific help and support resources from both Muse um, as a core team and the community of vendors that we work with that extend Muse. So muse.adobe.com is always a great place to hang out. This is kind of maintained by the Muse team. We do update it from time to time. So we pushed out a release. Um, it always seems like a blur, but uh, in February, we pushed out a release. And that's been out. We pushed out a dot release or a bug fix release just last night. Um, so you may want to close the Creative Cloud app and open it again if you don't see an update there. But that will help with bugs um, that may have cropped up for you as you're using the application. So I encourage you to download that dot release. And uh, I know there was some comments this morning on the forums that the release notes were not available yet. Hey, Laurel D, if you're bored um, and you do see a link to the release notes for this dot release, maybe put that into the chat um, so that folks can see it. All right, today's session is focused on contact forms. All right, Andrew says they're already posted, which is great. So uh, feel free to upgrade. It's safe. It's really from the team. Uh, on the tutorials page, as I mentioned, we've got some new videos that show off the latest uh, features uh, as of February. And I mentioned that we do have recorded sessions and such. So if you come into the events area or you go to Facebook, these past recording links now point to a YouTube channel. So if I click here, it's going to take me to Owning a, a business uh, is tough, and some people an ad. Sorry about that, but um, there are recordings here that you can watch to follow on if you would like to. All righty. With that said, a little bit, I'm going to pull up the notes that we're going to reference today. We're going to focus on contact forms. So I do want to start with just a little bit of a preamble here. Um, I have been a career product manager, but in my time I worked on the web segment. I worked a little bit on Dreamweaver. I worked for quite a few years on Fireworks. And uh, I was part of that process. I was part of the acquisition of Adobe Business Catalyst about six or seven years ago. And for about two years I worked directly with the team on a CMS. Um, when we established Muse, there was a thought that really Muse would just drive people to that content management system. And what I think came out over time with that is, first off, content management systems, no matter what you do, are incredibly complex. They're kind of their own world. If you've ever worked on WordPress or Joomla or Drupal, they're intense. Another aspect of, content, of uh, CMS systems, though, is that it does have a back-end database that you can rely on. So, for example, if you're working with a CMS and you want to have a contact form, you can both receive an email from that contact form, but you can also log into the backend system and run a report um, and ex export all of the contacts that you've gotten from folks. You also can easily do email campaigns, let's say. It's easy to pull up a data set from that contact form and mail out to your base. That's the good side of a CMS. The harder part about a CMS from the perspective of Adobe Muse 
is that there is no right answer. The right answer is what your client wants to use. And if you have what we would call a green grass opportunity, if you have the ability to start from scratch and build exactly what you want for a client, you can often drive them to use certain tools, certain hosting platforms, certain backends. But more often in my experience, the client is set in whatever tools that they're using. And you're only as good as your weakest link, which tends to be the technical skills of your client. So if you have a client that needs to use a back-end complex blogging engine, you may get into trouble because they're not computer people. They don't spend their days doing that. I'm always a big fan of, of Tumblr, for example. A Tumblr blog is free. Um, it can be skinned and styled. It can blow into Adobe Muse in interesting ways that we can talk about at some point. Um, but the nice part about it is it's incredibly easy to use because it is designed for end user customers. They've got phone apps and desktop apps that allow them to easily add content. In the world of contact forms, you need to decide for your client, do you need to run backend databases? Do you need to run queries? Is that really critical? Or is it acceptable for your client to just receive an email and deal with that email appropriately? Because this is a jam session, I learn from you guys as much as you learn from me. Um, and I have a question, which is, has anybody ever found a tool that'll allow you to point to a whole bunch of, let's say, emails that you've just received with contact form details and actually roll those into a spreadsheet? Does that occur in nature in any way? I've not really dug around too much for it, but I'm curious because that is kind of the only downside to not having a backend database is if you wanted to mail out a broad base of users you can't easily grab their email addresses or grab responses um, from an email the way you would a database in a spreadsheet. Okay, so let's start with just the basics in Muse. Sorry for folks that are a little more experienced here, but sometimes we gotta start from ground zero. Um, I'm gonna come on in and start just a clean page and show the basics here. So if you're familiar with Muse, probably already know this, but Muse basically consists of a couple of things. There's the feature set within the application, and then there's this idea of widgets. And widgets are common web behaviors that can be skinned and styled to look like the experience of your website and configured for particular functionality. So the Muse team back in the day, when we first shipped the application, um, went in and implemented a widget library. And the widget library is probably getting a little long in the tooth. We're starting to look at how we might re-engineer some basic aspects of the widget library, but you might guess that that's a complex undertaking. So nothing really to uh, talk about too much right now. But we are really looking at that because websites have really evolved and the skill set of the Muse users have really evolved. Widgets, though, in their basic sense, we have folders here. And one key to a folder is, for example, if I want to do a slideshow widget, I can choose from any of these. They're configured differently, but I could always take, for example, a full screen widget and configure it to be a basic widget. They are just options or variations of the same widget. If I come into the form widget, we give you two. There's a detailed contact form and a simple contact form. If I press and drag that simple contact form onto the canvas, as I drag the object onto that canvas, I get widget options that pop up here. And I can come in and configure certain attributes. Now the miracle of all miracles that the Muse team pulled off is that contact forms can work on just about any hosting platform. I believe they require some basic PHP on the backside. Andrew can probably correct me. Um, but those forms really will work. You don't have to worry about where you're hosting. And indeed, you can even come in and define any email address. Now, the Muse may gripe for a moment and warn you that the hosting platform does want to see at least one email that points to the domain that you're hosting with. But I don't think that's actually always true. It does depend on the hosting you're working with. So for example, I host with GoDaddy and I don't bother setting up GoDaddy email addresses. I just use whatever Yahoo or Adobe email that I'd like for that form element. So notice it says email to danny at adobe.com. It's kind of interesting. I'm not sure if we change that or if everyone gets a default form that's got my email in it. But my assumption is that it's going by my Adobe ID 
and it's just popping that in there as a default, which is pretty sweet. But I have the ability to come in and add additional. Yeah, Andrew says it does change. Good thing, because I like getting mail from the world, but not that much. Um, I can come in here and add additional fields as I'm working um, or remove those fields. Now, there are some defaults, and we're working with those defaults to see some of it is legacy. Originally, the forms we designed and used in Muse blew only into Business Catalyst until we managed to extract from that and go to any hosting platform. I'll come in here and give this a form name. Now, this is important because the email that you receive is going to reference this name. So if this is for a client, let's say it's for Ike's Bikes, I'm going to say Ike's Bikes uh, newsletter. For example, if I wanted to create a form to allow people to sign up for the Ike's Bikes newsletter campaign, for example. Email to, I can come in and add commas. I can say email to me, email to uh, Andrew, because I want to pick on him, at uh, Muse. Hmm. See, now I'm going to forget his email address. <laughs> Guess what? You don't get picked on. Laurel does. <laughs> yeah, widgets.moo. Sorry, buddy. Andrew at widgets.moo, comma, and I can put as many email addresses as I'd like there. Um, and everyone will receive the email that is on that list, comma delineated. Uh, after sending, you can stay on a current page or go to a different page. This is a really nice feature that you may or may not have overlooked. So sometimes just giving that customer satisfaction when someone submits a form, a lot of times it may be report a concern or they're inquiring about your business. So to be able to follow up and just validate that you will respond to what they've said can be awfully nice by way of the stay on current page or go to a particular page. Um, and let me kind of show that for a moment. If I'm here in my site, this might be contact. And then what I'm going to do is create a second form that's like thank you, let's say. And what I can do is on that page just really add some simple text that says thank you for contacting us. If this is an emergency, call, you know, if you want to be nice, somebody. And this, of course, would be skinned and styled just like the rest of your site in a way that it almost appears as though a, a message comes up. A nice way that you can do that, just to kind of exaggerate this for a moment, is if instead I came here and I duplicated my exact full contact page. So if I duplicate it, so that it really does give you that same feeling, and I added my note here as, let's say I chose to do it as an overlay. Um, I'm not going to be all that fancy now, of course, but let's say I came in and gave this a fill of something. Oh, you get the point. So a white fill, we'll set it at about nice little tint here. I'm going to overlay the form. Try to do something meaningful with my text, but I doubt it. And we'll do something awful like this. So just to drive that home, what I would do is come back to this contact form now. And in my email to, after sending, I can say, after sending, go directly to, hmm. It's going to be contact copy because I did not bother naming that. Let's go back and give that a nice name again. Thank you. This is where you got to love Muse. It does not lose track of page names, so although I pointed to another name, it now points to the contact thank you page. So as I'm working, I'll come on in and preview this form. It may get mad at me because it really likes forms to be live and doesn't preview all that much in the browser, plus I'm going to have defaults. But if I hit that submit button, it would bring up that next page. Okay, so uh, let's keep going through the form options here. So I've got that guy, I've got that follow-up contact thank you form, um, and then I've got form elements. Now, although people in the forum sometimes seem to think that the Muse team is sleeping at the wheel, we really, 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 really are not. So when we built out contact forms, 
Some of it is we only have so much engineering, and if I told you how many engineers they were, you would think we're rock stars because they are rock stars. They do a lot with what we have for staff. But we've gone in and added some level of form elements, but there are definitely some form elements that are missing. So basic functionality, you have the ability to have names, email addresses, phone numbers and such. You can format as such. You notice we have reCAPTCHA and BC CAPTCHA. We're actually going to probably make that a, a drop down, so you pick one or the other. But the idea is if you're hosting on Business Catalyst, they have a built-in CAPTCHA. If you're not clear what CAPTCHA is, those are those annoying little things that pop up and prove that you're human. Um, if you're working with a non-Business Catalyst hosted uh, form, you're going to want to choose the reCAPTCHA. And reCAPTCHA basically will work on different hosting platforms. One thing I want to point out, because it's always um, life's great mystery, and that is the hierarchical structure of widgets and such. So notice how, um, let me just show this to you, because it's really important when it comes to forms. If I have nothing selected on the canvas, notice here on the left it says page no states. If I click once on the form, um, I'm now clicked on that form. It says form normal state. Now I can come on in and look at each of the states of this widget, and I don't know if many of you caught the old press release, if you ask me, but the um, breaking news with our February release, which is the ability to come to any element and actually clear all styling. This is the most magical feature for people who do a lot of work in Muse. Because each element in Muse can have an up, over, down, and active state. And the truth about that is it's so annoying when you're trying to work with a contact form and set the state for every single object without it popping up. So um, I just love this feature. It really makes life um, streamlined pretty well. But staying with the selection model, I'm here on an individual object. So if I click once, I've selected that form. If I want to get to this enter name field, I'm going to click a second time. And notice that I've now selected the form field, which is this group right here. I'm going to click and also this is worth mentioning. If you're not sure where you are in this hierarchical structure, notice as I roll over the object, I get a tooltip that says text input. That's telling me that if I click a third time, I'm going to be at that text input level. Now, if you click too much, hit the escape key. It's going to back you out. If I escape again, it's going to take me up to that form level. Now, the reason why this is so important is a few things. One is if I click once on this form and look at my options, there's a certain set of options there that relate to the form as a whole. One of them is this edit together feature. This can be magical if you're trying to be productive and you can organize your thoughts really well. What you want to do with edit together is try to edit together as long as you can. And in that way, anything I click on that is of a similar type, it's going to take those siblings and apply any styling and such that I do to one to all of those objects. Now, if I want some other objects to be different, I can go and uncheck Edit Together, and it will allow me to style things differently. But let's say everything's going to have the same font, and everything's going to have the same stroke. It's really good to sh be able to use that Edit Together feature until you're ready to then go in and say, eh, some of the items are going to align to the left, and some will be centered. So you can really control that with that object selected in that way um, here with the edit together. So we're at the form level and I'm seeing all my options. If I come in and click once, click twice, uh, click three times, I can get to that text input field. And notice now when it comes up, it's a different set of, of options. So it's really important to know how you get there. For different fields, um, in some instances, like email right now, we require it. I think we're playing with the idea of not requiring it. I think we can work around that. But you can choose whether or not it's a required entry field. You can also decide, is there default text? Some people don't want to have the title here. They just want to, in the field, let the user know what they're supposed to enter. It's much cleaner that way. Um, Message text here is going to let you know really visibly is it required or not. So another way that people tend to do that is they may have just some text up here that says required with an asterisk. And then they'll put the asterisk over those form elements that are required. So different approaches. Another powerful way to come in and style this stuff up, if you're not familiar with it, is depending on where you are in that selection state, 
click once, click twice, click a third time, I can bring up my right menu and notice that I can select same or input. When I do that, it's going to shoot across. If you think about that hierarchical structure, before we offer this, it was such a pain to have to tunnel in. Let's say I want to move all of the fields over a little bit. I'd have to go to each individual one to select it. This allows me to select across the form and just inset my, my form fields here by a certain amount if I'd like to. Same thing with the label here. So I'll keep clicking until I get there. Let's see if I can do this. Right mouse, select same label, and bring that up. I could come in and do something different, move them down a little bit if I like them a little closer to my form field. Okay, so nice powerful ways to do that. As you're working and as you go along, you also can just come in and delete things that you don't want anymore. You can move these items pretty freely wherever you'd like. What you'll notice is the container here for the form is going to get bigger. And if any of you have ever um, dealt with forms in the past, there used to be this kind of painful part about forms where notice if I go under my form state here and I go to the error state, see this little error state that's here? I can choose to have that or not. I can come in and delete it if I don't want it for each of the states. Um, but what becomes odd is let's say I come on into this element and I decide the submit button should be right here and I want to put content below it. The annoying part is everything looks good and here's my form, it's looking really good, and I want to have content below it, and for the life of me trying to resize this form, it's not allowing me to resize the container. And that's specifically because of that submit error state. If I were to come in and move this guy up, without selecting the whole container, if I move it up, notice that there's one for each state there. So I've got submit success, submit error, progress, but as such, that field is now moved up and the overall container gets smaller. So this nice feature that we added where you can hide and show all of the elements on the page. Notice for a moment I came in and showed that. So under view, I said that I wanted to, um, uh, what's it called? Hide edges. So hide and show frame edges. I'm showing those frame edges. I use keyboard commands. But when I do that, even if I'm not in that odd state that brings up the error field, I can tell that that container is there and that it's going to get in my way. OK. Um, going forward a little bit, we use a few levels of spam protection with differing results. So we try, even if you do not put um, a CAPTCHA on the page, we do do some form uh, server side checking. So if someone submits from the same IP address a number of forms um, in a short period of time, we will stop accepting forms from that IP address. So let's say you're under a phishing attack, a spam attack, and someone wants to send you 500 form fields. Um, we now check that on the server side. It's not client side validation, it's server side to make sure it's a, a valid form. And if there's too much action in a short window of time, we will cut it off. Sometimes it seems that that doesn't always work. So having the ability to add CAPTCHA is a good way to add that one higher level of security, in essence, um, around the form. All right, I'm going to check on chat, see how the world is going. And we're going to start to play with some nice variations here. Any chance of adopting the new no CAPTCHA recaptcha Google API? Um, we can't talk futures. We're not allowed. But um, it is something we're exploring. So um, it's always something to stay ahead of because these spam people like to chase us and undo whatever we've done. So we are exploring other um, forms of spam protection. I will leave that as such. OK. Continuing with the form. Uh, so this is all good. There are some limitations, and I just kind of want to talk about them for a moment. Um, some of it is when we have engineering time, we try to bite it off and chew it. Um, one thing that was important to us when we built our forms is we believe the designers that are building Muse websites want to be able to skin and style these OS level controls. So if I come into my form here and I add, let's just see if I can get back to that state. 
I add a checkbox or two or three. Um, when I do that, I have the ability to come into this object. Notice it's a graphic element. I can change the fill color, I can change the stroke, I can control it um, to a great deal. Now, folks have asked for radio buttons and drop downs. Um, radio buttons does seem reasonable, I accept that. Um, so we have that on a shorter list. Drop downs, when you think about it, a drop down has elements that are defined in the drop down, a set. You've got the arrow, you've got clicking it, you've got the drop down window, and the ability to style out that whole element just to have it happen. I know it sounds like a great excuse, but we need to come in and style all of those elements and make sure they're available for you to be able to control. But it sort of lends me to one of the great reasons why Andrew's here with us today, is Andrew used to be on the Muse team. He was one of our quality engineers and he left us, but he has kindly continued to be involved in the Muse community and has built out widgets um, that extend some of the core functionality of Muse. He was one of the two people that actually got Moo Cows born. Now he did not name it Moo Cows. I can't blame that on him. That was the engineer. Now the engineer promised we would never go public with it, but guess what? It's called a Moo Cow, which is a Muse uh, configurable widget somehow comes there out of moo cows. But uh, cows, when they're mooing, uh, allow you to come in and build widgets of your own. And there is an amazing community that has really exploded over the last few years that allows the extensibility of Muse. So I've already showed you f widgets that we've built here that are built in. And you can come in and customize and style these widgets. But this land of configurable widgets is pretty exciting. So I'm going to go on over to my library at this point, and I've got widgets that I've added from the community that are related to forms here. So um, let me just do this. Mr. Andrew has widgets.moo, and I've got a number of form elements I can work with. Now let me jump out just to show you a little bit of what we're talking about. So if you go to muse.adobe.com and you click on the widget tab, Alternatively, if you are in your library folder and it's looking really lonely because you have nothing in there, um, what you can do is with nothing selected down here in the lower area, you can click on the Find More Library Items Online. And that's going to take you to the same exact space. The Muse widget directory, its intention is not to get in the business of widgets or get into the way of any of the widget developers that are out there in the community. This directory is simply a way that we can categorize um, sort um, and enable the searching for widgets across lots and lots of vendors. And I've heard from many of the widget vendors that around half of the sales that they're getting right now is coming through this space. Now what you can do is come on in and search for forms and you'll get a nice list of what users have provided, what our widget developers have come up with. Um, and some are for free, some are for pay. Uh, it does sort of lend itself to the next point that I will make, which is we started a new campaign yesterday, and it's the Widget Wednesday. It could be the Wacky Widget Wednesday, but we'll just call it Widget Wednesday. And if I go to the Adobe Muse Facebook page, um, what we are going to do is once a week, to the extent that our vendors want to cooperate with us, we will take a paid widget that's popular and probably has a lot to do with the jam sessions that I'll give on Thursdays. And for 24 hours, we'll make that free. Actually, the, the vendor is providing it for free. So this week's widget um, is from Muse Themes. It's the first we've done, and it's a WooFoo form widget that allows you to easily work with third-party um, forms. So we're jumping ahead a little bit there. I'm going to talk about that. But um, in this widget directory area, if I come on back here, um, you can find Andrew's forms bundle, for example. And the way it works is he's gone in and said, you know, there are some shortcomings to what it is that we're offering in the, the main aspect of Muse. And he's gone in and looked at sort of those weak spots and added things like if you want a drop down, if you want radio buttons, a color picker, date picker, and time picker. Now, this will somewhat illustrate what I'm saying about native elements versus um, elements that can be skinned and styled. 
So he's got standard form stuff here. You've got what's your name, what's your email, and that's probably, my guess, using the built-in Muse form. But he's augmented that um, with some nice little elements. Nice layering you got there going on, Andrew. It's so, like, three-dimensional. <laughs> But he's got, um, and that's new to me, he's got the ability to set times here. I had not seen that before. I think that's a new addition. Um, you can come in and select from a color picker here. Uh, we traditionally did not have the ability to, yeah, we haven't had that in a form. You also can have a radio button set that you can choose here, and then you can have a drop down as well. Um, notice that when I click on date of birth, I bring up a calendar widget. So here's the hard slash interesting part, and Andrew may um, correct me if you'd like to, but I think I'm right. If you look at, for example, this calendar picker, I've got a drop down for years, I've got a drop down for months. I do not think that I can control the way this looks. Notice that it's a serif font or sans serif, and then when I go back out, it's a serif font. Um, I don't think that you can control these OS level attributes. Depending on what you're working on, though, if you really want a calendar picker, um, you can add it. And if you work hard to sort of integrate what's native OS, you're going to have to look at Mac and PC um, to see how that form is going to look on different platforms. Um, you can work to style it so that it looks a little more cohesive with the rest of your site. But that's sort of the downside. If the Muse team builds it in, you can style it to look for sure like everything else on your site. Um, if not, you have to kind of deal with that and see to what extent you can customize those OS level controls. But let's show you a little bit how I might work with that. So here I am, I've got the widgets.moo. Um, let's say I want to come in and add just the drop down list. Um, actually, it's kind of complicated as I remember. <laughs> I'm going to keep it simple. Let's try the form dates field. Um, and all I'm saying is you'll see when you come to grab it. So notice here, he's got some guidance. Add a date picture to the text fields. Use add a new text field, give it a unique label, and add the label below. So uh, notice what he's saying here. It has to be called date. So I'm going to come on in and let's just not touch that for a moment. I'm going to leave it alone. So notice I've just got this little weird Cody thing. Um, I think I need to just come into this guy. And let's see, I'm going to add a new one just to play it safe. Andrew loves when I get it wrong in front of everybody. I think I did last week. So I'm going to go in and just use a single line text field. And I'm going to call this date. And for good measure, I'm going to go ahead and move my little widget down here. And let's go ahead and preview it in the browser and see. Now it's getting mad at me because CAPTCHA is not communicating with the back end. That's fine. I'm just previewing. Um, so here CAPTCHA's a little reCAPTCHA works very closely with Google and you need to set up a private key. Um, but once you've done that with Google, it behaves quite well. Um, for the moment, I don't want to go there. Hold on. Let's try it again. I clicked the wrong button. OK. Come on. Don't be mean to me. What happens is we're... Uh, Click OK to learn more. What about cancel? OK. So notice that I get a date field here, and I can come in and choose that date. So that's simple. Again, I probably would want to make the rest of my form look like these um, fields and colors and such, but I can just integrate it that simply. So that is available um, from the widget directory. I'm going to stop and check on the crowd a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, other third-party widgets that are out there. So anything pressing here? Looks like that's an answer in the question area. So widget list for widgets to be automatically synchronized on the PC and notebook. If I follow that, it's I would love to be able to, let's say I'm an art director and I have a staff of six and I have a widget library. Whenever they open up a Muse project, they're alerted if I've updated the widget library. Things like CC libraries that you've heard about, wouldn't that be great? Um, but yes, nice feature request, I agree. Uh, looks like you guys are good, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, let's talk about some of the other stuff that's out there for forms. 
I went through, and whenever I'm working on site of the day and we're gathering up what we want to showcase, it's always nice. Sometimes I'll see sites that may not be a site of the day, but they have a clever implementation. And if you ask me, um, there's the default set that Muse offers, and then there's some of the more lean forward bits that folks want. There are times when you're going to use a third-party widget to embed a third-party form solution, and we're going to get to that. I'm keeping an eye on time here. Um, but there's a lot of times that the built-in one that we're offering can be just lovely and creative and pretty much cover what you're after. So um, some of the real, real, I can't say it, real-world Muse um, sites that I saw, for example, here is a contact form um, that is one of the site of the days. I'm going to give that a chance to load up. So if I go down to contact here, sometimes people, definitely when we're judging site of the day, one of the things I love to check is the contact form. Did the designer take the time to really work on an innovative contact form? For some reason, my machines, oh yeah, is what happens when you're recording at the same time that you're presenting. I'm working a little hard today on my system. But if I scroll down to the contact area, um, notice this form. It almost looks like a CD label a little bit. It's got an image that repeats here. But I think this is just so fun. If I click here, what they've got is an accordion. So you've got a trigger and a target. And in the target, they've put an interactive map. So you can go on in and get directions, and it'll bring up a proper map. If I click it again, the accordion collapses. And then I have a form over here on the side. So the ability to come in and populate that and send it and then collapse that. I thought it was just so nice to just see that compactly represented. Um, another one that I thought was good. I'm going to go ahead and click all of these so that we can get them loaded. Sometimes you have a lot of questions or a lot of form elements. Um, this one is just a nice design where it's got just some nice aesthetics around it. I thought it was just a great way to integrate a form without it just feeling like an afterthought. So being able to design around it, and this is what I'm talking about for being able to style every element of the form fields. This other um, was a nice example of when you're trying to build a complex form and you say, well, I need a radio button because it's going to either be this sort of answers or that sort of answers, I think sometimes there are other approaches you can take. So here's another example of an accordion that notice that it's set to move the content below it out of the way. But depending on who it is that's asking the questions, you've got some nice structure here and the ability to sort of hide and show that content. Now, when we talk about contact forms, and I did say that there are definitely some missing elements, radio buttons are not there, and you can work around that to some extent. Um, another big one that's not there that's painful is the ability to let your users upload a file. So you do have to know that when I go to Seattle and hang with the engineers, I do try to go sit at their desk and cajole them um, to do certain things. And we were talking about contact form improvements. The whole go browse for a file and upload it can be complex if you think about it, because Muse is using pretty much a flat file structure when we upload to any hosting platform that's out there. So for us to start to manage files that are uploaded to that hosting provider, and make certain that what you're uploading is indeed not a virus that's going to be executed on the hosting platform and indeed something safe to be delivered is a little more complex than we're going to take on right now. Um, I have done something, I'm not proud of it, but I will show it because <laughs> it's a jam session and we have to, um, have to be honest. If you come into the Adobe Muse site uh, in the widget area here, uh, this is the widget directory, and whenever people want to submit widgets that they want to include here, the thumbnails and the descriptions for me, they click on this submit widget area. Now, I needed an upload button. Um, this is the form that I did. I wanted to use Muse, because how else do we learn if we don't try to use our own tools? And so I added a field here to attach a file. Now, what I've done, and this is the sort of not best part about it, but it works, when you click attach file, it takes you to a service. It's called Drop It To Me Muse Widgets. So what I did is I used Dropbox and I created a Dropbox instance. Um, and on the form, it requests a password, which somewhat protects you from a bot or um, phishing or bad 
viruses coming in the front door. So notice here it says Muse Rocks is the password. When I click attach file, if I come in and paste that password and then I log in, it allows me to basically come in and go grab a file that I'd like to upload. Now when that happens, I'll just show you this. I've got a Dropbox account, and it's my main Dropbox account, but then I created just another stray odd Dropbox account. I used a random email, and um, with that Dropbox folder, I have it in my system, and whenever anyone submits content here, um, I can see it in this custom Dropbox folder. So it's available for me to grab those files. Again, not the best thing ever. This is using a third-party service that brings in that back end. What would be the best thing? If you asked me, I would think this would be terrific if I could customize this UI and didn't have to show it. But then again, this service is trying to get something out of it. And if I don't pay them anything and totally get rid of their marketing here, they're not really getting anything out of the deal. But that's one way to work around for the attach file browse. Um, another way that folks have worked around that and also for other reasons, is using third-party back-end hosting services for forms. Before we go there, I'm going to just show you one more clever um, widget Im implementation that I thought was kind of fun and I tried to build this week in Muse. So if I go back to my list here, um, this is a photographer's website. And it's just very warm and friendly. It reminds me of Mad Libs magazines when I was a kid, which was a long time ago. So notice in this contact form, what the web designer's done is made it kind of playful. So you want to contact this photographer, and she wants to kind of bring out her personality and your personality. So notice she's got this sort of paragraph here. Um, it says, my name is, and when I click, I can come in and say, my name is Danny. If I hit tab on the keyboard, I'm getting married to uh, Tracy. How's that? Um, you can describe this as fun. So notice as you click in here, it's giving you a suggestion and definitely good planners. I heard about you from a friend or Google. So notice that the default state is to suggest the answer. If I hit tab on the keyboard, I can come and fill that in. So I tried to do a test to see if I could achieve that in Muse and I got I got there pretty much. So I've gone in and I just kind of copied and pasted that text and I've got the background text that's here and then I just took the form. This is standard Muse form. So let's make it easy on ourselves here and I'm going to go ahead and select that text and lock it. The hardest part of trying to do this is truly making sure that your form elements align with your text objects across browsers and across platforms um, because browsers are going to render it a little bit differently, what I cannot do is come to this form field and paste it in line with the text. So it remains a separate form. You'll notice if I drag this off, but I just went in and set the default values. Um, I gave it a little underline because I thought that was a little nicer. You'll notice that, for example, I just want to say email here, but I want a big enough field that they can enter that in. So I can come in and say my name is Danny. Um, fiancé Tracy, we're fun, and we're very organized. So Muse will get you there. And then you've got the send my note, you've got a larger form field here that you can come and enter. Again, just playful ways to think outside of the box. You guys are designers and I expect you to take these tools. You don't have to bother coding anymore, which gives you extra time to be really creative in your design process. So as we go along, um, we talked a little real world muse and some inspiration. Now we're going to segue into this land of embedding. Um, so if you decide that the form field that we're offering, you have to have um, a calendar widget, you have to have um, any of the things that we're missing, the ability to go browse for a file. There are a number of vendors that work with Muse that have built out Moo Cows to help accommodate that. And two clearly come to mind. One is the freebie that we're giving today, which is a Wufu um, widget that we'll look at a little bit. Another one is I need to get my act together, but Muse, the Muse team, we're working on some articles, and one of those has to do with a jot form widget. If you beg me and send me an email, I could maybe um, throw it your way so you can test it for me. But the JotForm um, widget is there as well. 
So if you're looking to find a third party backend form service, the advantages are that once again, you can run, you know, you can export a spreadsheet if you need to. There are things like MailChimp, which do email campaigns. If your client does want to run campaigns on a regular basis and is receiving a whole lot of forms such that you do not want to try to combine them on the back end, looking at MailChimp as a solution combined with Adobe Muse can be incredible. And I'm going to go back to this directory now for a moment. If I can get back there. Uh, if I go back here and I just put in Chimp. Maybe. Let's try this again. Widgets, mail. Yeah, this search is a little too precise, if you ask me. It doesn't do parcel searches that well. So if you search for MailChimp, you've got MailChimp Lite, MailChimp Newsletters. These are all folks that are allowing you to use MailChimp to do email backend campaigns. So you sign up for that service. And then using any of these widgets, you can come in and drop the form field onto your Muse site um, and be able to allow folks to submit into the MailChimp backend so that you can do an email campaign for that purpose. If we go to the other elements, let's go back to here. And I'm going to just go to my filter and go down to forms. You've got the MailChimp bits that I showed you, um, and then other different forms. Here's the Wufoo form that's for free right now. So if you click it in the next hour and 13 minutes, um, if you're listening to the recording, it's too late, um, you can download this for free, and then set up a back-end Wufoo form interface. But the way this guy will work for you is you can come in and build out a more complex form. So if I come take a look here, this is, um, interestingly enough, most of the vendors that we work with, when they use Muse to show a preview, you can trust that that is a Muse rendered page. So notice here that Steve Harris of Muse Themes uses Business Catalyst to host um, because it's part of his Creative Cloud account, um, and he's got a page for this form. So this is running, this is a Muse page. If I come on in and say, one way you can always tell, although that's being weird, Okay, is I can view source. I think he's turned it off. <laughs> so uh, he's got a trick that you can't actually look at the source code on this page. How's that for fancy? Um, but if I could, I would know that it was a Muse page. Um, notice that he's got some of the nice elements here, but I do have to point it out. Notice that these are kind of using OS level controls. You can have different alert states for what you're doing based on the fields. You can have, um, again, those drop downs. You can have browse for a file feature. Um, and this is by way of that Wufoo form. So if you're interested in exploring that, definitely grab some of the links that I've got here. So now that Muse has been around for a little while, um, there are tutorials in the community that are built by these form people. So um, let's just see here. I know I grabbed some. Tutorials? No. Um, sorry, looking for them here now. All right, geez, thought I was losing it for a moment. So notice the embed form tutorials from the vendors. So um, one, two, three, Muse talks about how to um, use the contact form and embed it on your site. It's a good basic tutorial there. JotForm actually shows you how to use JotForm and configure it to work specifically with Adobe Muse. Uh, and there are a number of other tutorials that we have that we've produced here. So Muse Themes has done some that explains how to use the Wufoo form widget that you get to download for free. He's got a video there. Um, the Muse resources area talks about a form as well. Let's kind of take a quick look at that behavior within the application. So now that we've got that cute little um, Dear John bit done, we'll delete this. And I can come in and look at that a little bit here. So if I come to Wufoo Forms, press and drag it onto the canvas, notice that it's rendering a form for me. So he's giving you a default instance that you could play with. Um, as I go to the flyout, all I need to do is define my username. This is the account name that I've defined and the form ID that I've defined with 
Wufu. So I went to Wufu. I create. I didn't, but Steve did. Went to Wufu, created an account, um, defined which form attributes he wanted to use. Notice here you've got open Wufu form site that'll take you there. He can customize many of these attributes. If you work really hard, um, you'll get it exactly the way you want. There's another way you can actually try to actually inject some CSS styling if you use it as an embed code um, and change some of the default typefaces, but that gets a little trickier depending on what you're looking to do. Um, so that's one way to get there. The other one is the one that I alluded to. So I've got a jot form widget. Let's drag down here and see if this works. So this is a very simple widget. Um, and notice that there's a series of little options. So this is one that's under development with us. Um, Chris Kellett of 123Muse um, is building it out. But it allows you to do um, nice little bits here. I can hide and show the JotForm logo. I can have the form scroll, which is painful if I need to. Um, but same difference here. I can come in and define a job form ID, and it's going to populate my form element here. Now again, the beauty of that is I can log into JotForm or Wufu Forms. I can run reports. I can extract um, the content into a spreadsheet if I'd like to. All right, we're coming up on the top of the hour. So what I'd like to do is stop a little bit and see um, if there's anything I'm missing in the conversation that we should cover over. Uh, I'm going to go so far as to swing into this last closing state. This is an opportunity for you to tell me if this was a good session, if we covered everything you wanted to. If not, I'm glad I exceeded at least three people's expectations. All right, four. Um, if I did not hit your mark, um, put it into the chat and tell me what you really wish we had covered. Because we do do this session from time to time. It's always um, improving as we uh, hopefully we get better each time. So. It's not a perfect world, as I mentioned. Um, I would love if we had every form feature built into Muse, but I do encourage you to kind of use your mind to really think about backend data and what Muse does really, really well. Um, and the ability to use these embeddable widgets um, that allow you to embed forms from third-party solutions, I think will always be the best answer. The default form that we offer should get better, and that's a matter of some engineering time to solve that. But for more complex form scenarios, I really encourage you to look at these third-party tools and see how it works.